Hi, I'm Greg Tripoli from the Onondaga Historical Association. Welcome to another segment of Bedtime Stories from OHA. So before I turn in myself, I wanted to share another one of my favorite stories from our local history. And the story that I want to tell you today is about two guys, two local guys from Syracuse, from our Jewish community, the uh, very tight-knit Jewish community of the 15th Ward, uh, who actually went on to create a little company called Metro Goldwyn Mayer, MGM. Now, the guys that I want to talk about are J. Robert Rubin and Lee Schubert. Now, Lee Schubert, I told you a little bit about the Schubert story in a previous bedtime stories. Sam Schubert was the middle of three brothers, uh, older brother Lee Schubert, younger brother J.J. Schubert. Sam was the guy who really got the family started in the theater business. He was the one who had the charisma, the personality, uh, the one who got people interested in investing in him. And he built the company up to the point where it was a real contender in the theater industry in America. Uh, Sam unfortunately died tragically in a train accident in 1905 when he was just 29 years old. But his older brother Lee and younger brother JJ, now Lee was uh, this very like overly polite, very proper, um, aloof, cold, kind of guy, very Natalie dressed. Uh, JJ, the younger brother, was just the opposite. Kind of thick necked and uh, uh, looked like he slept in his clothes, had a bad temper, always ready for a fight. But those two came together, they split the business 50-50 and they built the Schubert organization into the largest theatrical empire in the world. Uh, now these guys had about uh, over a thousand theaters across America um, at one time at their peak. Um, and they did all of that with people from their Syracuse 15th Ward neighborhood. I'm talking about the financial backing, the um, management expertise, all the people who were the right-hand men, the art decoration, uh, uh, design, uh, talent, uh, advertising expertise, and legal expertise. And that's where J. Robert Rubin comes in. Now, the Schubert's had this huge empire of theaters, but the very first theater uh, in that string that has been unbroken in history um, was the Bastable Theater here in Syracuse in their hometown. And uh, the owner of the Bastable at the time, a guy named Frederick Bastable, he was a very prominent guy in town and very respected. Uh, and he kind of considered himself uh, uh, the owner of a legitimate theater. Um, he had a lot of people come in who were important people to do lectures and presentations and uh, symphony music and uh, legitimate plays that he produced in, in, uh, in that theater. So the Schuberts, however, uh, had a very different idea of what would be good for them. And they kept their ear to the ground. They knew what people wanted and they gave it to them. And at the time, people wanted uh, sort of a more upscale vaudeville routine kind of uh, extravagant musical, uh, musical review. And um, vaudeville at the time was kind of considered uh, a sort of lowbrow form of entertainment. Even though this was upscale vaudeville, Frederick Bastable was having none of it. And so he sued the Schuberts over their lease of that Bastable Theater. Now the Schuberts hired a local attorney uh, from the Jewish community, a guy named William Rubin. William Rubin was the older brother of J. Robert Rubin. He was actually still in uh, law school at the time at Syracuse University College of Law. So, um, but there's no doubt that he watched this trial closely and he made connections with uh, the Schuberts that he kept for a lifetime. Uh, the the Rubins and, uh, and Schuberts won that lawsuit over the Bastable Theater in Syracuse and lawyers became a staple of the management team at the Schubert organization. Uh, J. Robert Rubin, after he graduated from the College of Law at SU, he uh, went into business here, into the law business with his older brother, William, uh, ostensibly working also with the Schuberts. Um, until about 1910, he married a Syracuse girl and then moved to Manhattan, where he became the assistant district attorney in Manhattan for four years, from 1910 to 1914. And then he began to uh, really specialize in entertainment law. And he had a lot of the early movie moguls, movie making was in its infancy at the time. He had a lot of movie 
moguls as his clients. Now, uh, at the time, and this is in the early 20s, uh, there are three things that movies needed in order to become successful. Uh, they needed theaters in order to, in, in which to, to show their movies. They needed content. They needed stories and, uh, and music and lyrics and things like that. Uh, at the time, um, producers owned all of that stuff, the scripts and the music. Um, so they needed content. They needed talent. They needed actors and directors and choreographers. Now, at the time, early 20s, uh, there was nobody who owned or managed more theaters, who had more content ownership uh, from over 20 years of Broadway hits, and who had more talent under contract. Nobody in the world had more of any of those than Lee Schubert. So I'm not really sure who introduced whom uh, in the beginning of this, but at, uh, at one at, you know, at, at an early point in the movie business, uh, we see Lee Schubert and uh, J. Robert Rubin uh, doing business with some of the same people. And I wanna talk about specifically uh, two of those people. Um, one was Marcus Lowe. Marcus Lowe had a movie production company called Metro Pictures, but it wasn't very prolific and he didn't have the knack for making hit movies. So Marcus Lowe made his money in providing movie houses, theaters, so people could show, so production uh, could be shown in, uh, in the movie houses. Now, Lee Schubert was leasing and selling uh, some of his underperforming theaters. Live theater was logistically uh, difficult and very expensive. So he was selling and leasing these underperforming theaters to Marcus Lowe and together they were converting those theaters into movie houses. And, um, and they both made a lot of money and became very close friends in the process. Lee, as I told you, was kind of very uh, aloof and cold. He didn't have a, a lot of close friends, but Marcus Lowe was an exception. And, uh, and actually, in the, uh, uh, eventually, Lee uh, uncharacteristically openly wept when he delivered the eulogy at, uh, at Lowe's funeral. So another another guy that uh, that Sam Schu or that uh, Lee Schubert and uh, Ruben were uh, working with another one of Ruben's clients was a guy named Sam Goldfish. Now Sam Goldfish eventually changed his last name to Goldwyn, and he also had a uh, a movie production uh, uh, studio, but he also could not make hit movies and was not very prolific. But what he did have was an enormous production studio, forty four acres in sunny Southern California, just outside of Los Angeles. Schubert, who um, first convinced Marcus Lowe that uh, Goldwyn had, uh, quote, some assets which, if handled properly, could be of great value. Um, but it was likely Schubert who said to J. Robert Rubin, uh, his friend, uh, that, you know, there's, there's this other guy, uh, your other client, that I'm really interested in. Um, he's the guy that we need, and we could create a company that would corner the market in this fledgling movie industry. And that guy was Louis B. Mayer, L.B. Mayer. Now, um, J. Robert Rubin was not only L.B. Mayer's attorney. He was really Mayer's business guru. Uh, Mayer never made a move uh, in his career without first checking uh, on the advice of J. Robert Rubin. In the biography of uh, Louis B. Mayer by Scott Eyman called Lion of Hollywood, he uh, talks about Rubin as the, uh, quote, most cr uh, a critical person, most crucial person in the life of Louis B. Mayer. And, um, and, and that makes sense because uh, Louis B. Mayer made his name, his fame, and his fortune um, with, uh, with MGM. So, because L.B. Mayer has the managerial expertise to make hit movies. And all the cinematic stars of the time were uh, aligned with Mayer because they wanted to be in hit movies. So Schubert said, you know, uh, uh, with the studios from Goldwyn, the theaters from Lowe, and the movie-making genius of L.B. Mayer, we really could create this great company. And on April 17th, uh, I think in uh, uh, 1924, uh, Metro Goldwyn Mayer. It was Schubert and 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 Rubin uh, who negotiated the deal uh, for Mayer um, and got his name in the title, even though he wasn't bringing any of these big assets uh, to the table. 
So uh, MGM was created as a subsidiary of Lowe's Corporation, which was headquartered in New York City. That's kind of where the business uh, was. And LB uh, Mayer went out to uh, California to make movies. Uh, Lee Schubert and uh, J. Robert Rubin were both founding board members, uh, uh, and they also were major shareholders. Lee Schubert was actually a board member of both Goldwyn Pictures and uh, Metro Pictures uh, before that. Uh, J. Robert Rubin was uh, on the board of directors. He was the uh, um, the general counsel. He was uh, a, a, had a share in the percentage of the profits, and he also uh, was really the business mastermind uh, behind the company. Now, Lee Schubert was doing business with Sam Goldwyn uh, because Lee Schubert provided the content for the movies that Goldwyn wanted to make. And uh, I actually found an agreement between Lee Schubert and Sam Goldwyn from 1919 that gave Sam Goldwyn all of the rights, uh, first right of refusal, to all of the Broadway uh, uh, productions of the Schubert brothers. Um, so that was their uh, connection. Uh, J. Robert Rubin, of course, was providing the legal and business expertise. So I've been doing research on the Schuberts for about 12 years now, and uh, and the Schubert archives are um, our treasure trove of information. And I want to give a shout out to the Schubert archives people. They're amazing, and those archives are amazing. The Schuberts kept everything. Now, the Schubert archives are located in the beautiful Lyceum Theater of the Schubert uh, organization. The Schubert organization owns 17 landmark theaters, and this is one of them. In fact, it was uh, built in 1903. It is the oldest legitimate Broadway theater. It was built by a producer named Daniel Froman. It's a Beaux-Arts building with a beautiful colonnaded limestone facade, and the inside is just as ornate. When he built the theater, he built um, an apartment for himself on the top floor above the lobby area. And you can imagine it is a spectacular apartment. Actually, in the dining room, uh, there's a paneling in the dining room, and one of the panels is hinged and it opens up, and you get this, uh, there's a hole, and there's a clear view down to center stage uh, of the theater. And the, and, and the legend has it that uh, Froman was married to an actress who had a tendency to overact, and so he would be up in the apartment, he would wave a white handkerchief through the hole that she could see, uh, to give her kind of uh, uh, um, an indication to tone it down. But uh, the archives are located in that apartment of Daniel Froman on, uh, uh, in the Lyceum Theater. So I've spent many hours in the living room of that spectacular apartment doing research uh, on the Schubert Brothers. And, uh, and it's, 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 a great, uh, it's a great experience. So I was looking you know, over the, the correspondence between all of these parties during uh, during this process and during the beginning years of MGM. And it was very cordial and very interesting uh, to read. Of course, there was a lot of uh, Lee Schubert who was uh, trying to uh, propose uh, content, you know, uh, Broadway shows to J. Robert Rubin to see if MGM would produce movies, most of which were politely uh, refused by J. Robert Rubin on, on behalf of, quote, my, my colleagues or um, uh, the California studios. Uh, there were um, requests for charitable contributions for each of their charities. J. Robert Rubin was very uh, charitable. He was on the board of trustees of Syracuse University. He received the Aarons Award. The Schubert Foundation is one of the largest of its kind in the world, funding regional theater all over the country. Um, they had a lot of thank you notes and, and invitations for uh, premieres, of course, movie premieres and opening nights on Broadway. Uh, a December uh, 1939 letter from Lee Schubert um, uh, recognized the demand for the tickets for the premiere of Gone with the Wind. And he uh, writes and says, uh, even first row balcony would do, uh, which I thought was funny because it kind of intimated that that, that was the the, uh, the worst ticket that he would accept. And front row balcony is a pretty good um, is a pretty good seat. There are also lots of introductions, as you can imagine, to uh, young actors and actresses at the time. Uh, there was one interesting note from uh, Goldwyn to Lee Schubert that uh, asked if he would meet with a talented, young, and lovely uh, girl named Doris Day. So the uh, MGM, the studio that uh, these two guys from Syracuse created, uh, eventually, and, and 10 years after 
Uh, it was created in 1934. Uh, it, it had over 120 acres, something like 25 sound stages, 4,000 employees, uh, uh, 71 featured actors, and 17 directors. I mean, it was a uh, it was a major studio. And in 2004, uh, Sony, the company Sony, bought MGM uh, for around five billion dollars. So that's not a bad legacy for two uh, poor kids from the Jewish section of Syracuse, New York. Um, the story of J. Robert Rubin and, uh, and uh, Lee Schubert building MGM is also featured in our latest edition of our magazine, uh, History Highlights, so you can get that at Wegmans and Topps or Barnes & Noble at our store here. Uh, the best way to get it is becoming a member because it's a member benefit. And uh, look into our membership. Uh, there's some great benefits. Uh, you can become a member for as low as 25 or $30 a year. So it is bedtime now. I want to thank you for joining me on another segment of Bedtime Stories from OHN. I look forward to sharing another story with you next time. Bye-bye.